grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, put on your thinking cap and see if you can answer the following questions. When did Chevrolet introduce their first V8 motor? Anybody know? 1918. Got you on that one. 1918, now you know. If you could go back in time, say uh, 1915, visit Henry Ford at the Ford Motor Company and buy a brand new Model T, what color could you get it in? Green. All Ford Model T's were painted green until Henry Ford discovered that black would dry quicker and better and so you could get a Ford in any color you wanted as long as it was black after production had made green Model T's for a year. Now you know. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by his cousin John the Baptist, did he receive the Holy Spirit? in the same way that you and I receive the Holy Spirit at baptism? Some say yes, some say no. That question popped into my mind for some reason last Sunday. I got out the lectionary and I looked at this coming Sunday, the baptism of our Lord, and I saw that the text was when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. And for the first time in 34 years of preaching, I thought to myself, did Jesus get the Holy Spirit when he was baptized? What does research reveal? I got out all my old theological books. I got on the internet. I surfed the world wide web. I opened the Bible. I read all kinds of biblical texts. And it occurred to me that as I was doing all of this research, we focus on what? The divinity of Christ, the miracles that he performed, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, raising the dead from the grave. But what about the humanity of Christ? Christ Jesus being both true God and true man. And so there's the little baby Jesus being held in his mother's arms. We just celebrated the nativity on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. If we look at the crutch up here, the camels are my favorite, by the way. I, well, obviously Jesus. Somebody's going to come to me after church. Don't you like Jesus? Of course I like Jesus, but I think the camels are really cool. But here is the baby Jesus right in the middle of the gathering when Jesus was a little boy. Did he have to learn how to walk or did he just come out of the womb and start making tracks? Did he have to learn how to talk? When he was looking at his mama, did his mama do the very same thing that you and I do? When we're holding a little bitty baby, whether it be a child, a grandchild, and we do what? Say, say mama, say mama, right? You know, say papa, papa, because papa's paying all the bills, right? Did Jesus have to learn his letters? When he went to school and there he was in the classroom, was he an automatic ringer? You know, I would have been top of the class except there was this guy from Nazareth named Jesus and he got the right answers all the time because he already knew. Did he have to memorize the Bible? How many of you memorized Bible verses when you were in confirmation class? How many of you remember still your confirmation verse? Yeah. Yeah, we had to memorize at least where I went to church. You had to memorize the 703 Bible verses that are in the blue catechism. And then you had to memorize your Bible verse. Mine was Revelations 2, chapter 2, verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee a crown of everlasting life. Years ago, I had a young lady in my confirmation class who simply could not memorize. It was beyond her ability, and we're going to have confirmation Sunday, and she could not memorize her Bible verse. It just wouldn't stick, and so I gave her the shortest verse in the Bible, which says, Jesus wept. That was her confirmation verse. I wonder if she remembers that 
to this day. Yeah. Did Jesus have to memorize the Bible even though he is the author of Scripture? Read John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. Jesus is literally the Logos, the Word. When God said in Genesis chapter 1, let there be light, that is the Logos which brings light into the world. Think about that. Riddle me this, my friends. If the very first thing God commanded was for light to come into the world, yet he did not make the sun, the moon, or the stars until day number four, where did all this light come from? Did God have a flashlight that was powered by the ever-ready bunny? Or is he himself the light? Think about that after the judgment day, after the end of time, there will be no sun, no moon, no stars. God himself will be the light. He will be the perpetual light giver. Once again, I refer you to John chapter 1. What does it say? In Christ was light. So Jesus being divine, being God, did he have to learn his letters? Did he have to learn all those tricky math problems, you know? A car left town A traveling at 60 miles an hour going to town B. How long did it take car to get from point A to point B? Did Jesus have to figure on his fingers and on his toes or did he automatically know the answer? We have absolutely no problem dealing with the humanity of Christ. When Christ is at the well with the Samaritan woman, what did he say? Give me a drink, I'm thirsty. Remember how that whole conversation started? The disciples went into town, they're looking for the dollar general or the family dollar to buy some supplies, and Jesus by himself, there at the well, the Samaritan woman, she comes out in the afternoon because she is being shunned by all the other people of the town because she's been married five times, and now she's living with a man who is not her husband. She is the Elizabeth Taylor of her day. And who does she meet but Jesus Christ? And he doesn't say, hey, how you doing? Or, hey, watch this miracle. I can, I can make the water spring right up out of the ground. In fact, I can go over to that rock there. I can hit it with a stick just like Moses did at the waters of Meribah. And water will spring out. And I'll, I'll bend over it like a water fountain. Why would Jesus ask the woman for a drink? And what was her reply? You have no bucket. You have no way to draw. There's the humanity of Christ. There's the humanity of Christ. We read, when the storm is there on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is in the bow of the boat, way up front, laying on a cushion, snoring away. The humanity of Christ needs to sleep just like you and I do. Even though the Bible says in the Psalm, Psalm 121, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. There's the humanity of Christ. Jesus is on the cross, nailed there on Calvary's hill. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he says. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother, he says to the apostle John. Into thy hands I commend my spirit, he says. It is finished, he cries out. The humanity of Christ is seen in that one single statement, I thirst. And we have absolutely no problem with that. Jesus being both true God and true man. 
But when we get to things like the letters, right, or, or, or Jesus in the carpentry shop there with Joseph, I mean, did Jesus, a little boy Jesus, have to walk up to a saw and say, Joseph, what is this? Did he go over to a plane and say, hey, Joseph, what do you do with this thing? Did he, did he look at the wood and say, you know, what kind of wood is this, even though he is the one who created all the trees in the world? Or did he have a leg up? Did he have divine knowledge to where he could point at that and say, that's olive wood and that's pine and that's oak and hey, there's one of those cedars from Lebanon. Did Jesus receive the Holy Spirit when he was baptized? Was it necessary for Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit in order to begin his ministry. I take you back to the book of Genesis when God made man. Have you ever thought that God kissed Adam? He did. He did. If you read the text, because how does God make man? Everything else is spoken into existence. He says, you know, let creeping things, and there's birds, there's animals, there's fish in the sea, there's green things that are growing everywhere, you know, land is separated from the ocean. God speaks everything into existence until it comes to making man. When he makes Adam, Adam, the name Adam literally means man, okay? So man was called man. What was Eve's name? Woman, yeah, thank you. I shall call her woman, says Adam, for she was taken out of man. All right? God forms Adam out of the dust of the ground, and then think about this. Think about, you know, picture it in your mind. Get a visual image of this. There's this lump of clay, this lump of lifeless flesh laying there in the middle of the Garden of Eden, and what does God do? He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. Correct. Soul. Not just a living creature like a dog, a cat, a camel, a horse, a goat. A living soul. See, animals are a dichotomy. Okay? They have a body, and they're alive. Okay? Men are a trichotomy. They have a body, a soul, and a spirit. They're alive. Think about that. There's God giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Or in this case, I, I don't know, is this a word? Giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth suscitation? Is that a word? Somebody help me out. Is that a word? It is now. We're going to say it's a word. If it isn't a word, we just invented a new word. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth suscitation. I like that. That's hard to say without your front teeth. Suscitation. Yeah, suscitation. Sounds like something Elmer Fudd would say. Yeah, suscitation. God kisses Adam and breathes into his body. That, my friends, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings life. Anytime a woman has a little baby, now, you know, we know biology. Okay, I don't have to explain to you how it works. If you don't know, go ask your mom. Okay. But uh, anytime a woman conceives, whether she's a Christian or not, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Life, life, new life. That is a creation and a precious gift of God himself. And so therefore, if we look at the Bible, if we go, for example, to Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel, he comes to Mary, you know, gets the whole Catholic thing going, Hail Mary, full of grace. And she says, how can this be since I have not known a man? And what does the angel tell her? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Christ is conceived, Christ is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Christ is conceived by the Holy Spirit. So there's one. 
Now we go on through the Bible, you know, we go through the Word of God, and what do we see? For example, I even wrote it down so that I don't misquote it, okay? We got uh, Luke chapter 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry, full of the Holy Spirit. I encourage you, my friends, this afternoon, open your Bible and read Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you now. But I want you to read it this afternoon. Do you promise me you'll read this this afternoon or to take you less than a minute? Okay. Everybody promise, raise your right hand and say, I promise I'll read Philippians chapter 2. I don't see everybody's hand up. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Yes, amen, Jeffrey. Listen to what Paul writes. Now consider what Paul writes. This is Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Paul writes, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I like the King James translation, something to be grasped. Okay, that's the literal translation, something to be grasped. Now notice how Jesus is juxtaposed to Adam there in the garden. Adam and Eve grasped at being God. Okay, what did they do? Satan came and tempted them. Did God really say, see how Satan corrupts the word of God in the same way he attempts to do that even today? And so what do they do? You know, eat of the forbidden fruit and what is his promise? You will be like God knowing good from evil. And the Bible tells us they looked at the tree. Hey, that's some really nice fruit. And they wanted to be like God, and so they reach up and they literally grasp at being like God. And now we read in the book of Philippians, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Okay? Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ, when he left his heavenly throne, when he left the right hand of God, when he told his Father, it's time for me to go, the, the time has come, the hour has come, I will go to earth, I will be in the womb, I will be born there in Bethlehem, I will grow, I will live, I will minister, I will suffer, I will die, I will rise again. He laid aside all his divine power. Okay? Doesn't mean he stopped being God, don't misunderstand me. But he laid aside all his divine attributes. Imagine this, imagine this. Imagine I had a million dollars cash sitting right here. Great big pile of money. Okay? Imagine, I don't know, how big would a million dollars be? We'll say this big, this big, this big. Yeah. And I'm hungry. And I want to go to uh, Wendy's this afternoon. No, I want to go to Popeye's. I love Popeye's. Oh my gosh, I would love some Popeye's fried chicken. Wow, I'm hungry after church. We're going to put away all the Christmas decorations, and then I'm going to go in fellowship, and then I'm going to get my car, and I'm going to go to Popeye's, and I'm going to order the big bucket, the big family dinner. I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to eat it all. But I leave all this money behind. I'm not going to use this money. I'm going to leave this money here. What do I have to do? They're not going to give me chicken at Popeye's, are they? No, I have to pay for it. I have to buy it. And so if I leave all of this behind, even though I have a massive amount of money right here and I could buy all the Popeye's chicken that I want, if I go up there without a dime in my pocket, they're not going to give me any Popeye's chicken, spicy or mild. So what do I do? I have to get a job. Maybe I tell him, you know what, I'll be one of your fry cooks. We'll trade out, we'll barter. Maybe I'll just, you know, carry out the trash and mop the floor and clean the bathroom. Somehow, some way, I've got to make a deal with them. Quid pro quo, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Even though I have the ability to buy all the chicken that I want, I leave that behind. 
and it changes nothing about me. I'm still Glenn Fisher, who wants a bucket of Popeye's chicken. Likewise, Christ, when he left the heavenly throne room and came down here to earth to fulfill the promise that God had made to humankind in Genesis chapter 3, he did not bring any of his divine attributes with him. How then did he perform the miracles that he performed? Look again at the baptism. Jesus goes, he's baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, there in the Jordan River. And note this, Jesus was not baptized for the forgiveness of sins. When you and I are baptized, we're baptized because we are sinful, right? We are baptized and that baptism washes away our sin, right? Jesus had no sin, therefore that aspect of baptism is not applicable to him. Why then be baptized? What happens in baptism? The Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit through that conduit enters our heart and enters our lives. God calls us by name there in baptism. There we are born again. When I was in the great state of Alabama, lived there for 12 years, one of the most common prior, the most common questions that people ask me, you know, here, when you meet somebody new, what's the very first question you ask? Where are you from? You go to Alabama, the very first question people ask you is, are you born again? That's why it's called the Bible Belt. And you know, for us as Lutherans, we really don't talk about being born again. We talk about being baptized, but we never really say, well, I'm born again. You should say that. You really should say that. I can tell you exactly the day, the time, the location of where I was born again. I was born November the 1st, 1963, All Saints Day. How apropos. And I was baptized on December the 6th, 1963. How do I know that? I was, what, five weeks old? My mother told me. She's got all the little certificates and the little baptismal cloth and the little shell they used to pour water over my precious little head. And John Coots, Pastor John Coots, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Orlando, held me in his arms, put me over the baptismal font, baptized me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And right then and there, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. God said, you are mine and no one will snatch you out of my hand. How did Jesus perform all the miracles that he performed? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen again. Listen again to the word of God. This, by the way, was prophesied. Remember, there are 322 prophecies in the Old Testament. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to grow up in Nazareth. He's going to go to Egypt for a period of time. That's Hosea chapter 11. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. I'm not going to tell you what that says. I want you to look it up. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. What are you going to look up this afternoon? 11, 2. Isaiah 11, 2. Compare that with Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 18. Compare the two. Let God answer this question through the scriptures. Let God answer that question. Look at this, Luke chapter 10, verse 21. At that time, Jesus, full of the joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to your little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. Look at this, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In my former book, O Theophilus, which, by the way, Theophilus means lover of God, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to preach until he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. Was Christ filled with the Holy Spirit when he was baptized? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Who raised Christ from the dead? Did Jesus raise himself? 
No, God, God raised Jesus from the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians. Okay, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do you mean under the earth? Does the devil believe in Jesus? Yeah, he knows him personally. Okay, read Matthew chapter 4. Do demons believe in Jesus? Yes, they do. Remember in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus casts the demons, the demons, plural demons, he asks them their name. What is your name? And they reply, we are legion for we are many. And they cry out to him, what have you to do today with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to torment us before the time? They know exactly who he is. But they do not have faith. See, that's the difference between you and me and the unbelieving world. You can take somebody that's an atheist, an atheist, And they say, well, yeah, I believe in the historical Jesus. I believe that there was a man who lived 2,000 years ago who went around with a really cool philosophy about love. There was a real guy named Jesus Christ from Nazareth. He preached. He got squashed by the Romans. He was nailed on the cross and died and was buried. But that individual does not believe in Jesus as their Savior. You and I do. And it's not because it makes sense. I always have a, uh, well, I don't want to say a hard time. I guess I see the pointlessness of trying to prove the Bible, of trying to prove Jesus, of trying to prove God. God will prove himself. Jesus will prove himself. The scriptures prove themselves. It's not my job. People want to get into a debate with me. Hey, you're a religious guy. You're a pastor. What about this? Okay, you know what you need to do? You read the Bible. Read the Bible with an open mind and an open heart, and then we'll talk. But I'm not going to debate. I'm not going to argue. What does the book of Isaiah say? So shall thy word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, depending upon the translation you read, but it shall accomplish the thing for which I have sent it. Paul elaborates on that Old Testament verse in Romans chapter 10. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Don't argue, don't debate, allow the Holy Spirit to do what he does best. Plant the seed. That's all you need to do. Plant the seed. And let the Holy Spirit do what he does. How many of you like to garden? Anybody here like to garden? You like to garden? Are you still with me? Hello. Welcome back. You like to garden? What do you do? You go out, you prepare the ground, you clear away all the weeds, you you work up the dirt, you get some humus in there so that it's going to be rich soil, and then you put the seed in the ground. Let's say you're going to plant black-eyed peas. Get that black-eyed pea patch all ready to go, and you go out, you plant all those black-eyed peas, and then you wait two, three, maybe four days, and you go out with a hoe, you pull that dirt away to see whether that seed has sprouted, right? How many of you do that? That ain't the way you garden, is it? You put the seed in the ground, you cover it up, and you let it alone. And you let God do the work. And maybe in four or five, six days, you go out and there's all these little pea plants that are sticking up out of the ground. God has done a miracle. God has performed a miracle. He has created life in your garden. That's a miracle of God. We take it for granted. We take it for granted. You know, case in point, case in point, I'm kind (laughs) of, kind of digressing a little bit. 
But I find this fascinating. I don't remember the name or the variety of date palms. But 2,000 years ago, when the Romans went to Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, there were date palm trees all around Jerusalem, and the Romans cut every single one of them down, and they were considered extinct for 2,000 years. And then they're doing an archaeological dig one day here several years back and they find a grave and inside the grave is a little vase that has some of these date palm seeds inside and they take one and they plant it in the ground a 2,000 year old seed that grew you can google it on the internet there's even a picture of it there on the internet that seed waited for 2,000 years Now you know why you can't get rid of the weeds in your yard. <laughs> 2,000 years and God preserved that seed and protected that seed as a testimony to himself. Something that you and I would look at and say, that thing ain't going to work. You remember last year I was cleaning off my workbench in the garage? And I found a package of tomato seeds that I hadn't planted and I looked at the date and it said 2012 and I thought that these things are done, man. They ain't gonna, they ain't nothing gonna happen here. And I threw them in the corner in the backyard, covered them up with some dirt and kind of forgot about them. I ate tomatoes off those bushes all summer long. And they were the sweetest, nicest little tomatoes and I don't remember what kind they were. God made life in the same way that Jesus makes life. Remember when he raised Lazarus? Remember when he raised the widow of Nain's son? Remember when he raised the daughter of Jairus? That was through the power of the Holy Spirit. When Christ himself was there in the tomb, who called him out of the tomb? Who restored body and soul together? The Holy Spirit the giver of life. What does that mean for you and me? It means we too have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Not that any of us can walk on water. Not that any of us can feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Not that any of us can raise anybody from the grave. But the Holy Spirit dwells within us so that we have faith. Faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith that Jesus overcame death in the grave. Confident faith that Jesus will raise us on the last day and call every single one of us home to be with him in paradise. Confident faith to know that those friends, those loved ones, those siblings, parents, uncles, aunts, grandparents are now with Christ Jesus in paradise because they believed. And they believed because the Holy Spirit gave them that power. Friends, that's what you and I learned today, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be raised back to life. And all God's people say, Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.